Bush tackles the SNL crisis, and House Democrats off on a retreat fret about the pay raise issue. This is NBC Nightly News, reported by Connie Chung. Good evening. President Bush today grappled with his first pressing domestic problem, trying to save the savings and loan industry. He looked at proposals for several hours, and as NBC's Jamie Gangel reports, no matter what course he takes, it's a no-win situation. The president summoned top staff to Camp David this morning for a brainstorming session on the savings and loan crisis. Last week, Treasury officials had suggested charging depositors a fee to bail out the SNLs. But that trial balloon went bust, so this Saturday, they arrived prepared to lay out more palatable options. At the top of the list, Bush is looking at the possibility of raising money through a bond issue and by raising insurance premiums paid by SNLs and other banks. White House aides say it would be a multifaceted plan where savings institutions would pay for most of the cleanup. Not surprisingly, bankers are not happy. It's like someone who's next door neighbor for years has been living a high lifestyle, driving an expensive car, finally goes bankrupt. And then they come to our family, our customers, and ask us to pick up the tab. Well, the thrifts have already paid $5 billion into the FISLIC fund as a result of the special assessment. And uh, obviously, they can't pay any more. White House aides say President Bush made no final decisions today, but wants to announce a solution early next week. And Bush is said to want options which will minimize political damage by sparing the budget and taxpayers. But industry analysts say in the end, taxpayers will pay, and if Mr. Bush puts it off, the price tag will be higher. Uh, ultimately, there is no choice but that the, the uh, taxpayers are going to have to pay. There just is not enough money any place else uh, to uh, pay the 80 to $100 billion that it's going to cost to clean up the FSLIC mess. Some members of Congress agree and don't want to be the ones to deliver the bad news to voters. So I think the important thing for everybody to understand is that uh, in one way or another, either the taxpayer or the depositors are going to have to pick up the burden here. The complaints don't surprise Mr. Bush, who's already said that any program will be unpopular and who knows that no proposal has widespread support. Jamie Gangel, NBC News, the White House. House Democrats are at a posh resort in West Virginia tonight for their annual legislative conference. But the weekend is plagued with one issue, the controversial pay raise. As NBC's Ken Bode reports, it's something they want, but don't want to admit they want. House Democrats, their wives and children, leaving town for the weekend after the Senate defeated the pay raise 95 to 5. The ride on a private train was to a West Virginia resort to talk about the future, but one issue dominated conversation. One Democrat said the Senate action would mean, quote, class warfare between the two houses of Congress. All attention and political pressure now is on the House. House Whip Tony Quello, with a sore eye, was also sore at the Senate. And they can't run and hide. They can't run away from it. We intend to vote, and we intend to give them a chance to make a decision and to see whether or not we should have these honorariums, special interest money, and whether or not we need this 50%. Quello says this is the one weekend each year Democrats get to see how Republicans live though the luxurious surroundings may be politically unfortunate, given that pay raise is the issue on everyone's mind. The retreat is paid for by contributions from labor unions, lobbyists, and corporations, along with $500 per congressman. There is unhappiness here that press coverage of the pay increase has focused almost entirely on Congress, ignoring top civil service jobs and federal judges. Members of Congress believe the raise for all is justified, but having to vote on it for themselves is like handing their opponents in the next election a loaded pistol. I don't think I should vote on a pay raise for myself, because if I do, the public's going to say, there these congressmen go, giving themselves a raise. I don't think it should be up to us to decide our salary. That's why we set up a commission. The 51% pay raise was recommended by an independent commission and endorsed by both Presidents Reagan and Bush. It is also endorsed privately by most of the wives here at the Greenbrier. 
Well, I think they'd be in favor of it if you surveyed congressional wives. I think they would be, as their husbands are, very concerned about the political ramifications of appearing to be for a pay raise. But the size of the raise, the public reaction, and the Senate vote have all caused Speaker Jim Wright to change strategies. The 51% raise will go into effect automatically with no House vote at all next Wednesday. The next day, Jim Wright will propose to suspend House rules and roll back the pay raise to 30%. Also to ban all honoraria, speaking fees from special interests. If two-thirds of these House Democrats and their Republican counterparts agree to that, then the Senate will be in the hot seat. Then the Senate can pick a 51% pay increase, a 30% pay increase, or no increase at all. Some members here say privately that no one has ever lost an election just because he voted for a raise in pay. But that is not an argument that carries much weight, with polls now showing 85% of the public against this particular raise. Ken Bode, NBC News, White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. The Washington Post, quoting official sources, says the FBI has received allegations that former Senator John Tower had a, quote, protracted relationship with a Russian ballerina in Texas. Tower, who's being considered for Secretary of Defense, has denied the Washington Post report, calling it an unbelievable wild story. Lewis Sullivan, nominated as Secretary of Health and Human Services, today tried to settle another problem that raised eyebrows and held up his confirmation hearings. He announced he would take an unpaid leave of absence from his medical school to avoid any appearance of conflict of interest, a salary he had earlier requested permission to keep. And another Bush appointee, C. Boyden Gray, who is the president's ethics watchdog, may suffer from the appearance of ethical problems of his own. The New York Times reports that Gray has been chairman of a $500 million communications company while working as the vice president's counsel. Such dealings are prohibited for White House employees, but technically the vice president's staff is not covered by White House rules. The Arctic cold wave that numbed Alaska last weekend brought blowing snow and temperatures as low as 50 degrees below zero to much of the rest of the nation today. There was too much snow for a major ski competition in Colorado. A freight train rescued a group of travelers from a snowbank in Wyoming, and a small Idaho town was left isolated by drifting snow. Heavy snow was reported in northern California. Snow showers are blamed for this 20-car pileup on a major interstate north of Los Angeles. No one was killed, but at least 23 weather related deaths are reported around the country. And coming up on NBC Nightly News, Rick Davis on the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan to be completed in four days. And now that Americans can dial a lobster 24 hours, how will that affect life in a small New England fishing town? Douglas Kiker has the answer. All Soviet troops will be out of Afghanistan in four days, according to a Soviet official. Other Soviet sources said today that all Soviet troops have withdrawn from the capital of Kabul, except for some 500 to 2,000 security forces still stationed at the airport. Rick Davis has this report from London. In Tehran, Yuli Vorontsov, the Soviet ambassador to Afghanistan, said, Within four days, no Soviet troops will remain in Afghanistan. Eight guerrilla factions are based in Iran, poised for an all-out attack across the border into Afghanistan. Vorontsov is trying to prevent that from happening when the Soviet withdrawal is completed. On the road from Kabul, it is far below freezing. The visibility along the treacherous way out is limited by a winter haze. There is a threat of attack by guerrilla forces, but these Soviet soldiers know they are going home. They are moving day and night knowing Afghanistan will soon be a thing of the past. Only 2,000 Soviets remain in Kabul, and they are anxious to get out fast. 28-year-old Vladimir says he and his crew want to stay in the army, but in an army keyed for defense. And he doesn't mean defending Kabul from guerrilla forces. The British Chargé, his embassy staff and Gurkha guards, arrived in New Delhi tonight from Kabul, along with French diplomats and Red Cross workers. Kabul, almost inevitably, is going to become more dangerous in the near future. Diplomats are not used to working in dangerous situations. You cannot conduct diplomacy in dangerous situations. A British journalist described the Kabul they left behind. And despite the Russian airlift of flour into the city in recent days, a lot of people still aren't having enough to eat. And this is causing uh, evidence, according to the United Nations, of malnutrition and actually death by starvation. 
This is the question mark. The Afghan army, will it be tough enough to stop the guerrilla forces if they attack? Major General Mohammad Assam says yes. He boasts of the skill and eagerness of his young recruits. But reports from Kabul say teenagers and men in their 40s are being forced into service. And how willing and able will they be to fight the Mujahideen rebels now waiting in the mountains surrounding Kabul? Rick Davis, NBC News, London. At least 300 people are believed to have been killed in the military coup in Paraguay. The leader of the coup, General Andres Rodriguez, took over as president last night. Ousted President Alfredo Strasser, who ruled Paraguay for 34 years, was captured by rebel forces and put under house arrest. No one else in reports. The overthrow of military leader Alfredo Strasser has made a difference in the mood of Paraguay. In the capital city of Asuncion, Thousands celebrated the coup that brought an end to Stresner's long-running dictatorship. This is an historical moment for our country. We, the young people, have been waiting for this moment. In front of army headquarters, evidence of the heavy fighting that took place is being erased. Also being erased are the name and images of the man many say ruled this country with an iron fist. There is harmony for all Paraguayans. Before, we couldn't talk because we were intimidated. Stresner, seen here some time ago with his generals, is under arrest. He is 76 and in poor health. He is reportedly being held at this military base, waiting to be exiled to another country. The new man in power is 64-year-old General Andres Rodriguez, who was sworn in Friday. Rodriguez, who was second in command to Stresner, said the coup made it possible for tranquility and democracy in Paraguay. U.S. officials have adopted a wait-and-see attitude toward Rodriguez. And we uh, encourage uh, uh, a move towards democracy and human rights, and we will be watching very closely and very carefully that there is a... Uh, that, 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 that they, they plan to do what they've said that they're going to do. And Many here are reluctant to discuss the negatives about Rodriguez, such as his alleged involvement in South American drug trafficking. The focus is on the positive and his promise to hold free elections within the next three months. Noah Nelson, NBC News, Asuncion, Paraguay. Attorney General Richard Thornburg said today that achieving a kinder, gentler America will require a rougher, tougher attitude towards drugs. Pointing to statistics that 60% of killings in Washington, D.C. last year were drug-related, Thornburg said the newly enacted federal death penalty for drug murderers needs to be applied. For the first time in three decades, the leaders of the world's two largest communist nations have agreed to hold a summit meeting. Soviet Foreign Minister Eduard Shavarnadze says Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev will meet with Deng Xiaoping in China in about three months. NBC's Keith Miller has more from Beijing. China's paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, and Soviet Foreign Minister Eduard Shevardnadze could not agree on an exact day for a summit. But Shevardnadze said it would be sometime in May in Beijing. It has been 30 years since Nikita Khrushchev and Mao Zedong held the last Sino-Soviet summit. The hostility that grew out of ideological differences then was set aside today, as Deng and Shevardnadze seemed ready to normalize relations. It didn't come without a price or compromise. Shevard Natsi, at a news conference in Beijing, said China's three demands for normalizing relations had been met. Soviet troops are withdrawing from Afghanistan. Vietnamese troops are pulling out of Cambodia. And Soviet troops in Asia reduced. Improved relations coincides with fundamental changes, economic and political, in the world's two most powerful communist nations. Shevard Natsi said there's nothing to fear in renewed Sino-Soviet ties, saying both countries reject a return to the communist alliance of the 50s. Their interest these days, he said, was peaceful coexistence and economic development. The Chinese have already assured Washington that there will be no change in Sino-U.S. relations. The Chinese may value renewed Soviet friendship, but they certainly don't want to jeopardize their valuable economic and political ties to the United States. Keith Miller, NBC News, Beijing.
He's creating for the Catholic Church quite a dilemma. He's immensely popular and he attracts many converts in Africa. But Orthodox Catholics think Archbishop Emmanuel Malingo's so-called healing mass is more like witchcraft or voodoo. The Vatican now faces some tough decisions on Malingo, as Stephen Fraser reports. <laughs> Zambian Archbishop Emmanuel Malingo in Rome, saying Mass the way he did in Africa, attracting thousands of people, people seeking miracles, raising their arms with the Archbishop as he prays for evil spirits to depart from those present. We must preach the gospel, we must cast out demons, and we must heal the people. Some are possessed, some are controlled by vices, uh, some have uh, plans to do evil. This is what got him into trouble in Africa, ordered to roll.